Goodbye, goodbye. Oh, I'm the dear baby dear from your eye. Though it's hard to part, I know, I know. I'll be the dear that never goes to cry. By March 1915, over one and a half million British men had rushed to sign up. So there was hardly a family that didn't have someone away fighting. Helen Thomas remembered her last evening with her husband, the poet Edward Thomas. I sit and stare stupidly at his luggage by the wall. He takes out his compass and explains it to me, but I cannot see. Then he takes a book out of his pocket. Shall I read you some? He reads one or two to me. His face is grey and his mouth trembles, but his voice is quiet and steady. And while he reads, his hand falls over my shoulder, and I hold it with mine. Keep the home fire burning, while your heart are For Helen Thomas, her worst fears were realized. When, in 1917, she received the telegram telling her that her husband had been killed in action. Vera Britton was a 21-year-old student at Oxford University. She, like the millions of other women left behind, lived in fear of receiving bad news about her loved ones. Her fiancé, Roland, was serving at the front. So were her brother, Edward, and close friend, Victor. Vera didn't want to be left out. She wanted to do something useful as well. So she left university to become a nurse. In a surgical ward, I had told Roland, the nurses hardly occupy the silent-footed gliding role which they always do in storybooks. The mixture of gramophones and people shouting or groaning after an operation relieves you of the necessity of being quiet. They were blaring blatant gramophones. Though the men found them consoling, perhaps because they subdued more sinister noises. They seemed to me to add a strident grotesqueness to the cold, dark evenings of hurry and pain. Just before Christmas 1915, Vera received some good news. It was a note from Roland saying he'd be home on leave. Two days later, the phone rang. Believing that I was at last to hear the voice for which I had been waiting, I dashed joyously into the corridor. But the message was not from Roland. It was not to say that he had arrived home that morning, but to tell me that he had died of wounds on December 23rd. I wondered however I was going to get through the weary remainder of life. I was only at the beginning of my twenties. I might have another 40, perhaps even 50 years to live. Her friend Victor was the next to die. Vera prayed that her brother Edward would survive. But in the final year of the war, he was killed as well. By the end of the war, Nearly every family in Britain had lost someone. In 1915, German airman Peter Strasser was in command of the Zeppelins that flew over Britain and carried out the first systematic bombing of civilians from the sky. A soldier cannot function without the factory worker, the farmers and all the other providers behind them. Nowadays there is no such animal as a non-combatant. 
One of their favorite targets was the Royal Arsenal at Woolwich, where they made shells and bullets. Gabrielle West worked at Woolwich. A few weeks ago, we heard distant guns in the middle of the night. We looked up, and there was the Zepp so low you could see the cars hanging underneath. My word, we did scoot. There was tremendous din of firing, and a great smell of smoke, and things began to patter on the roof. I thought I was dead that time. We, who strike the enemy where his heart beats, have been slandered as baby killers and murderers of women. What we do is repugnant to us too, but necessary. Very necessary. This was a new kind of war. This was total war. It meant that soldiers and civilians were all involved. The workers in the factories were as important as the soldiers in the trenches, and everyone was exposed to the bombs. Zeppelin raids killed or injured nearly 2,000 civilians. Britain was no longer a safe place for ordinary people. In England, just before the war, one of the most important political issues was the right of women to vote. It was the suffragettes who led the fight. First they tried peaceful protest. But when this didn't work, they turned to violence. Burning down and bombing buildings. The British government started a campaign to silence the suffragettes. They were sent to jail and forced to endure all the humiliation of prison life. Seven months before the outbreak of war, one of the suffragette leaders, Sylvia Pankhurst, was sent to prison for breaking a window. She, like many others, went on hunger strike and was force-fed. I heard footsteps approaching outside my cell. I was strangled with fear, yet alert to every sound. A crowd of wardresses filled the doorway. They flung me on my back, on the bed, and held me down firmly by shoulders and ankles. Then the doctors came stealing in. A metal instrument pressed against my gums, cutting the flesh. They were trying to get a tube down my throat. I braced myself to resist that terrible pain. They got it down, I suppose, though I was unconscious of anything then, save a mad revolt of struggling. The suffragettes called off their campaign as soon as war broke out. Most women felt it was their duty to help the war effort. At first they encouraged men to enlist and provided things for the troops. They collected millions of cigarettes, books and pairs of socks. By 1915, there was a shortage of workers, as so many men had joined up. In this total war, women were needed to take over jobs which had always been done by men. Of all the professions women took over, one of the most important was shell making. The guns out there are roaring fast. The bullets fly like rain. The aeroplanes are coveting. They go and come again. The bombs talk loud. The mines crash out. No trench their might withstands. Who helped them all to do their job? The girls with yellow hands.
In Britain, one million women went to work in the munitions factories, like the Woolwich Arsenal. The first time you go around, you think, what an interesting place. Then the evil smell becomes more noticeable. The particles of acid land on your face and make you nearly mad, feeling like pins and needles. Gabrielle West was part of the women's police service. Her job was to keep order inside the factories. The fumes often mean 16 or 18 casualties a night. You're blind and speechless by the time you escape. Some of the casualties weren't serious. Women cut their fingers or got grit in their eyes. But sometimes they were killed by exploding shells. What many of the women didn't realize at the time was that they were being killed slowly by the explosives. All the time they were in the factory, they were breathing in the poisonous fumes of the TNT. The first symptoms of TNT poisoning were like a common cold. But these soon got worse, as munitions worker Caroline Webb discovered. It was all bright ginger, all our front hair. And all our faces were bright yellow. They used to call us canaries. This doctor, he was looking at us girls one day and he'd say, half you girls will never have babies. And the other half are too sick. God help you. War work was dangerous, but the women knew that without their supply of shells and bullets, the men would lose the war. Sometimes when we come upon our little train, it will be all packed with different people. There'd be all the officers sitting there. Some of them used to look at us as if we were insects. And others used to mutter, well, they're doing their bit. We said, well, we don't mind dying for our country. The women believed that after the war, their work would win them the vote and recognition. But as the men returned, women were forced out of their jobs and equal voting rights with men were not achieved until 1928. Everyone was now a target. Total war meant even children were involved as fighting, gas and bombs destroyed their homes. Children were also used in propaganda. Governments had to keep up everyone's morale and keep the soldiers fighting. Propaganda postcards pictured tiny babies carrying guns, showing that everyone was involved and everyone had to play their part. Workers in munitions factories were urged on by these new words to an old nursery rhyme. This is the house that Jack built. This is the bomb that fell on the house that Jack built. This is the hun that dropped the bomb that fell on the house that Jack built. This is the gun that killed the hun that dropped the bomb that fell on the house that Jack built. Propaganda posters showed the enemy as a devil, someone to be hated. In newspapers, real events were distorted and exaggerated to make the enemy seem like a savage. 
British war correspondents in Belgium have seen little murdered children with roasted feet. The tiny mites were hung over a fire before they were slain. This was done by German troops, men with children of their own at home, or with little brothers and sisters of the same age as the innocents they torture before killing. On July the 1st, 1916, the Battle of the Somme began. It was the single worst day in British military history. There were over 46,000 British casualties and over 19,000 soldiers were killed. The British government carefully controlled how the newspapers reported the battle. They weren't so successful at controlling the new medium, film. The world's first war documentary gave people a much more realistic and shocking view of the war. People saw this silent film at the cinema. Music played as they watched. People were stunned by the images from the song. Some of them had been staged, but most were real. As the film showed the soldiers going over the top, the music stopped playing. And the audience could see the soldiers being killed. In lots of places, injured soldiers had to be led crying from the cinema, and other people shouted, My God, they're dead! The film was supposed to boost morale. It didn't. It was seen by an estimated 20 million people. The British government, like governments everywhere, quickly realized the power of the moving image. In future, Official films of battle would only show carefully selected pictures.